Taipei is going to be such, uh, and really the entire country, such a great, I think, uh, uh, example of how ride sharing can really mm -hmm. help. I mean, you think about you know the government goals of you know stronger economic growth, and you know ride sharing surprised. I mean, six mm -hmm. years ago we wouldn't have thought we'd be here in Taipei talking to you that mm -hmm. ride sharing can be a pretty important economic uh, growth engine, but also from a mobility standpoint, mm -hmm. become there as it turns out there was huge gaps in our transportation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't have a full appreciation for it until you begin to mm -hmm. see the service really explode and you see how it's changing in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, how people move around. And, you know, millennials, if they have their choice, would rather not drive. Mm -hmm. This next generation, Generation Z, probably doesn't want to, have to learn how to drive. Mm -hmm. So we have to have enough transportation options, I think, to support mm -hmm. those desires. And then what you get out of that is obviously what we all want, mm -hmm. which is fewer cars on the road and those on the road mm -hmm. have more people in them. Mm -hmm. um, and as many of those as possible be emissions free or, um, you know, better for the environment. Mm -hmm. So, But I appreciate you taking the time. It was helpful to hear. Uh, your perspective on this, and I hope that we can figure out a solution that you know works for mm -hmm. uh, works for the government and works for us. And that's generally what we've seen around the world: is this is not a uh, this is not a divide that can't be bridged. Well, I mean, I, I'm more as a technical geek <laughs> interested in, in in this automated driving, uh, you know, long haul trucks and uh, really the flying cars, the vertical <laughs> project elevate right, right. Uh, that you're bringing in. Right. And, and but these things have a distinctly different thing as you. Just described, right? They don't. We, we don't have people who drive helicopters for fun. Uh, a few, <laughs> a few hours or a few, a few minutes uh, during their their business. It has to be something professional. Um, that there really is no no question around that, right? Of and then you. and then uh, for professional truck drivers, we of course is that um, establish a even more strict. Uh, regulatory structure, and we're not saying that people can just hop on a random truck and drive them home uh, as as amateurs, right? As just anybody can drive a truck. I, I don't think that's true, right? And even for automated truck driving, you still have to have the local part of it, right? Once they finish the highway, there has to be somebody who, who right drive now, into right? The, the technology debunk. is is more for the longer stretches, right? Of sure, sure. Right, yeah, right, 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 right. So at least for the next, I would say five to ten years, we have to work on the way to how to switch from autopilot uh, to the local thing. And then, again, I, I, I wouldn't really trust it to, to a random person who, who just want to drive a truck for fun, uh, <laughs> even though they may have an amateur driver's license, right? right? So I think yeah. that's right, but I think uh -huh. there's a big distinction between that uh -huh. and someone getting in their Toyota Prius, uh -huh. who may be a teacher or, or mm -hmm. a student or a small business person, and right. saying, yeah, I'm going to make a, a little bit of money for a period of time. Right, exactly. So and, what and, I'm and saying is that... finding a way to encourage that. Yeah, right? yes, there are yes, some yes. distinctions, I think. Right, so what I'm saying is that uh, in the long term, like our emission-free and so on go, uh, the, your next steps uh, that, that's more robotic based. Um, I, I do agree and I think we can come up with innovative regulatory structures to make that happen, but, but in, in that future it is actually the habit that you're now uh, building in, in a sense, um, it, it's actually counterproductive to, to the future that you're describing because at that time we will need another professional class that can be the interface between the robots and uh, you know the public. But I do think this mm -hmm. period, so just in terms of passenger transportation, mm -hmm. uh, to get people more used to uh, you know, not buying their own cars, not using as much, sharing transportation, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. used to carpooling, mm -hmm. that's clearly going to be an important bridge to autonomy. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, yeah, but, but, you then you, but, but then according to your plan, then you, you will still need them to get professional uh, licenses as either robotic operators or augmented pilots. At that time, well, we'll right. see. We'll. See. I mean, you know, I don't know if that's, I mean, that's true in that's cars. In your I don't know if that's true in cars, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, flying cars are a different uh, mm -hmm. issue than kind of autonomous cars mm -hmm. that are on our surface streets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So maybe they would become but, guide, guides, but, guides, or you know, guided tour yeah. operators. Yeah. Well, the future is mm -hmm. going to be interesting. But what we know is right in front of us is mm -hmm. let's make ride sharing work here in Taiwan. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, yeah. Minister, so, I appreciate the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that we get to exchange candidly yeah. <laughs> yeah. our views. Yeah. Always better than the alternative, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Okay. And I do think that um, there is more uh, more tension between impacting. But if you understand that anything you send, I will be. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay.